Hi, in my series of lectures on research method, today I focus on how to construct an analysis framework for qualitative data. Analysis framework. So at the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain what an analysis framework is and what it is used for. And make your own framework of analysis based on existing studies. You can make analysis frameworks to guide your analysis of interviews, texts, observation notes, and pictures. You know, the text could be verbal, the text could be visual, and you can make analysis framework to guide you based on certain theories. What I'm teaching you is an analysis framework, uh, which means it is using a deductive way of approaching data analysis. This is an example of an analysis framework. What is an analysis framework? This is a framework for analyzing persuasive appeals in student requests based on Aristotle's conception of rhetorics. The appeals, pathos, logos, ethos, definition means appeal to emotions, reason, and credibility. And indicators, these are the definitions, and there are examples. I will come back to this later, but at least you know that this is what an analysis framework looks like. It has definitions of the concepts. It has uh, examples so that it would guide us in our analysis so that we are consistent in using uh, this framework throughout. So the framework you saw just now came from this study of mine. You can look it up and you can find out more. But the aim of the study was to examine students' strategies of persuading le their lecturer to grant their requests using Aristotle's rhetorical proofs of ethos, logos, and pathos as the framework. So now you've seen an example. What is an analysis framework? Well, analysis frameworks are designed to structure an analyst thinking our thinking and to help logical thinking in a systematic manner. In short, they are models that aim to guide and facilitate sense making and understanding. An analysis framework is often presented visually. You saw that in the table form just now. And to me, that really guides our thinking and our analysis as we look at each of the texts because the definitions of different concepts or categories are already provided. And you can make analysis frameworks for different kinds of analysis. Why do we need an analysis framework? Well, defining a theoretical framework forces analysts to be selective. Selective means we decide what variables are most important and informative and therefore need to be analyzed. This is going to help us because it tells us what does not need to be analyzed. It reduces the amount of information that will be collected and analyzed. We have a clear focus on what we are interested in. Not that we are biased, but when we look at the text, we know what we should be analyzing because our study is on that. So the analysis conducted using framework is focused on the research questions. It is systematic, comprehensive, and transparent and reduces the impact of selection and process bias. The objectives tell us we are interested in logos, pathos, ethos. So when we look at the student request, in that case, we look at logos, pathos, ethos. We don't look at other things. And if a few people are analyzing the data, a framework helps them to study the phenomenon using the same categorization, reducing duplication of information. If I analyze it, and my co-researcher analyzed it using the analysis, same analysis framework, the analysis should produce the same results. They, he or she cannot use other ways because we all agree to use this analysis framework for this study and we must stick to it. Stick to the definitions. It's very important for consistency in analysis. We continue on that why we need an analysis framework. It provides a theoretical underpinning to guide collection, 
collation, storage, and analysis of data by identifying key analytical outputs and products at each step of the study. It provides a way to organize what data to collect and how to analyze it. It is used to identify what information will be useful for analysis and what can be discarded. That is what does not need to be analyzed in the study. Uh, these are the points that goes back to what I have said just now. So it brings home the point that if we have a valid analysis framework, it is usually one that is based on a relevant theory. And when we have this, it will ensure accuracy in analyzing information that are important to the phenomenon or topic. How do we know that the information is important to the topic or our study? Well, these variables will appear in the objectives of the study. And what we are talking about here is the internal validity. That means in our study, is there accuracy or not? Are we analyzing things that are important to this study? And if we are, then the results can be trusted to accurately describe the participant's perspective or reality. This goes back to our understanding of why we do qualitative research, which is to understand the participant's perspective or participant's reality, their meanings. So do we accurately describe their perspective or reality? If we do, then we have internal validity because we already started with an analysis framework that is valid and based on theory. Internal validity is the prerequisite for the results to accurately describe the reality of other people in other contexts, but they are similar to our participants. And that is about external validity. And here it all starts with a valid analysis framework. What about reliable analysis framework? What does that mean? It means that one that is detailed enough to ensure consistency or dependability in the analysis. If the uh, analysis framework is not detailed, we ourselves cannot use it in the same way. What more to say other people? Normally in qualitative research, if we were to publish papers, they expect at least two persons to analyze it and to report the similarity of the analysis. So having a detailed analysis framework is very important to ensure consistency of the process that is the analysis. And then the product that is the results, we must report it with lots of details so that others can replicate our procedures and there will be external reliability. So at the end of this lecture, you should be able to make your own. So now what I'm telling you is how I made mine. So from that, you can make your own. Today, I focus only on text analysis because this is less focused on compared to analysis of interview transcripts. Textual analysis is a methodology that involves understanding language, symbols, and pictures present in text to gain information regarding how people make sense or understand life and communicate life experiences. So remember, qualitative research aims to understand a topic or phenomenon from the participant's perspective. That is, understanding meaning in context, how the participants experience, feel, or think about something in the natural environment. All right, how to make it? There are many theories on persuasion strategies. I chose to use Aristotle's principles of persuasion. So when I chose to do this, I look at papers and I look for the fact that they use Aristotle. If they use other uh, principles of persuasion, then I do not use it because I have decided I will use Aristotle. So the papers I refer to must use Aristotle as their analysis framework. So in writing this, um, research method, what I do, I say, number one, it is a descriptive study. Number two, the text analyzed. These are requests written by 165 students in the English proficiency course in the Malaysian Public University. And the instrument used is the analysis framework on persuasive strategies based on Aristotle's rhetoric. And data analysis procedures, uh, yeah, I skipped the Data collection, okay, data collection procedures. Students were asked to write a request to persuade their lecturer to end her class early. Requests were collected for analysis. At least you read this, you get an idea where I got 165 requests. And what do I do for the data analysis procedures? 
Well, I describe how I use the framework that I have put here. Yes, I uh, identify them using analysis framework. One sentence sometimes contains more than one persuasive strategy. So then I will analyze two inside there. That's why the total number is not 165, but closer to 200, because a lot of them use two strategies to persuade. And uh, I also noted personal pronouns to identify the self or other focus in the use of persuasive strategies. Is it themselves or does it involve another person? So this is how I use the analysis framework. Uh, providing that framework, uh, that part is the instrument. Now, how I use it needs to be described because just looking at the table doesn't mean everybody will use it in the same way. For example, yeah, the one sentence, some people will think that there is only one request or one strategy per sentence, but it is not so. And I announced that I will take as many, I would quote as many as is necessary. Now I go back to how I made the analysis framework that I showed you. You must remember there are not so many papers in the world that is about Aristotle's rhetoric and on student requests, because if there are so many papers in the world, then I don't need to do this study anymore. There is no more research gap. But there are papers that uses Aristotle in other contexts, and there are three of them here that I use. One, letters of complaints. Second one, social or environmental reports. And the third one, political speeches. So I use these three to make my own analysis framework. First one here, I took a lot from uh, our memory 2014. And I also took from Higgins and Walker 2012, that is number one here in the superscript. So I acknowledge where I took the definitions from. I do not steal them from other researchers. But you see the last part, I did not put any uh, superscript. That means it came from me using emotive words and adjectives to manipulate feelings mentioning values, either their own or the target's emotional state in order to persuade. This is what I found from the student request and I work it into my analysis framework so that when I go on, I will use the same way to analyze. And I will say, yes, if I see these values, if I see emotive words and adjectives, this is pathos or appeal to emotion. Next one, when I form this, analysis framework for logos, I took it from two sources. And this one is easier uh, as in uh, people are clearer. So I didn't have to make my own to add to it. If I see factual language, then I will code it as logos. Maybe they will use linguistic links such as initially, later, and so on for logical reasoning. And finally, for ethos, I took it only from one source, Higgins and Walker 2012, because the others did not have much information on ethos or appeal to credibility and trustworthiness of the speaker or the audience. Okay, uh, here you can see from the example, not so many uh, students wrote this. We should end class early today because it will show that this note of persuasion has worked and indirectly shown Dr. XYZ's class of teaching us Persuasiveness is very effective. This one wants to compliment the lecturer so the lecturer feels happy and will end the class early. It's affirming the credibility of the lecturer. So this is one way the student persuaded the lecturer to end the class early. This is ethos. I did not have to add my own definitions because definitions from Higgins and Walker are okay. Uh, it's just that other researchers didn't go much into this. So, you see how I search for information to make my own analysis framework, uh, but they have descriptions. They just didn't produce it in a table. But I find that if you put a, it in a table visually, it helps. But I could find the information here and there in the method and in the result sections. So here I show you how I did my detective work from the first one, letters of complaints. Some examples of pathos are here, but not exhaustive. I have underlined them and I actually worked them into my um, framework in the table. So this is how I made, I look through the paper to find. And then for ethos, I said I took from Higgins and Walker and later there is some that appear in this uh, Jordanian study on letters of complaint. It just says, it shows the morals of the speaker to establish more credibility. But I took and learned from the examples here. 
I'm not trying to cheat because I hate cheating and cheaters. That's why I can talk about the morals and so on. So I extracted as much information as I could from the papers, whether it is from their description or even from their results, their examples. And I worked out my own definitions if necessary. This is from uh, Higgins and Walker. Uh, the table actually appears like this, but with no clear definitions, but it shows examples of persuasive techniques. If I did not know what is similitude in gratiation, then I look up the meaning of this because there are all these definitions out there. Okay, so this is how I understood the different uh, persuasion strategies based on Aristotle's rhetoric and based on other people who use Aristotle's rhetoric in their study. So in that process, I made my own. So you can see how I did my detective work, getting information from all over the papers. And I made my analysis framework that starts with naming the appeal, giving definition, giving indicators or descriptors and examples. The indicators are actually operational definitions. That's why I talk about uh, seeing factual language, seeing linguistic connectors and adjectives and so on. And because when you see those, then you know how to code them. Is it emotional? Is it a, a logical appeal? Or is it appeal to ethos or credibility? And examples are a great help because analysis of qualitative data is not clear cut. It is often very confusing. And this is the process of qualitative research. I improved my analysis framework as I went along. Then you say, what happens to the early ones that you have analyzed? Well, I went back and reanalyzed them until the analysis becomes stable. Normally, the analysis will only become stable after five to 10 texts, uh, of, uh, 10 to text, uh, ten, five to 10 texts. So we have to keep going back to make sure that we have analyzed things in the same way. And after that, it will be okay because we have understood things and uh, it will be stable. There will be consistency and reliability. So in conclusion, I would say that using an analysis framework to guide the analysis of qualitative data is very important. And this is the deductive orientation of thematic analysis. For novice researchers, I do recommend using an analysis framework for qualitative research because the framework is anchored in theory. Once it is anchored in theory, it lends validity to the analysis and the study. And in addition, having an explicit guide also ensures reliability or consistency in the analysis. So we get uh, two things, validity and reliability. When we have analysis framework, it's like killing two birds with one stone. Of course, there is the other approach, which is to use the inductive approach of analyzing data. That is to start from the data and to see what patterns emerge. But new researchers are not familiar with the field and therefore uh, may not be able to spot the patterns or they uh, cannot exclude other information that are not relevant. And therefore, it will be a very messy process. You can only do this after you're familiar with the field. So it is good to have an analysis framework and to use the deductive approach if you are entering analysis of qualitative data for the first time. 